I find that not many people are willing to open doors for you because they think it might hinder their opportunities. But if you turn that mindset, it's really only like that at the bottom of the food chain. As you go up, you find that there's more collaboration rather than competition. So I truly believe that there's abundance. Sarisha, why do you do what you do? Oh, that's a tough one. Just kidding. Um, so I, I've been an entrepreneur since 18 years old. And I think not coming from a rich family just pushed me to wanting to create the life that I wanted for myself and be an inspiration to my younger family members and those around me. And if I can inspire one person every day, I think that's a job well done to be able to make them believe that nothing is impossible because life is tough comes with different challenges but if you don't try you'll never know so as cliche as it sounds that's literally what i live by growing up were there seeds planted for entrepreneurship um i grew up in a entrepreneurial home to a certain degree because my grandfather was an entrepreneur um, he owned uh, a bottle store um, he owned uh, fruit and veg companies so very common Indian community businesses and um, just watching how he was able to just uh, grow from strength to strength and we were not rich but we made it work and and we made sure that there was food on the table every day and I just learned from that I learned that nothing was impossible and I can do it. I, I can do it myself as well. This belief system and mindset, where did that come from? That growth mindset and your perspective of the world? I left the house at 18 years old. So I was living by myself close to university in Johannesburg. And uh, leaving the house meant that I also needed to be able to fend for myself to a certain degree, especially not coming from wealth. And I, I had to be a tutor a bartender, a promoter, and eventually I was like, well, if there's so many things that are there and there's abundance of opportunity, I want to be able to be at the top of that food chain and I want to open up a business of my own and, and be the person that uh, creates the opportunities, not the one that is working for someone else. And if I wanted to live the life I wanted at that super young age, I had to have multiple income streams. So I always had to think about what was my next move and how was I going to do that. And it really came down to education and educating myself, not necessarily through a degree, but rather the things of interest. So I would Google anything that came to my mind and how could I make it happen. Or because I was a bartender in, jo in Joburg, I would meet uh, different people from all parts of the world. It was in Bromfontein, Kitchener's actually. And uh, they came with different perspectives of life and different things that they were doing. And I was always so engaged by those conversations that I would go home and then go research what we spoke about. And it really just opened my mind to so much that the world has to offer and the things that I could uh, be a part of. If I had to ask you what contrarian truth do you find to be true about the world that not many people agree with you on, what would that be? There's no scarcity. There's absolute abundance and it really just comes down to mindset and no specific location but just in general I find that not many people are willing to open doors for you because they think it might hinder their opportunities but if you turn that mindset it's really only like that at the bottom of the food chain. As you go up you find that there's more collaboration rather than competition. Um, so I truly believe that there's abundance um, and no scarcity. And do you think that that scarce mindset for these individuals, it comes from a place of not having previously, and so now they have, and they think that it's going to get taken away. So for those individuals, what reassurance do they need for them to believe that there is enough for there everyone? There is enough. I think that's a tough one because it really comes down to mindset, right? So I strongly believe in manifestation and what's meant for you is never going to pass you. And there's different lessons that you have to learn along your journey in order for you to be that successful person at some point in your career, in your life. But it doesn't come when you're not ready. It comes when you're ready. So the duration that it takes you to 
becoming successful in inverted commas because success is determined by your definition of it. I think is it's really down to mindset and how are you going to think? Have you learned enough in that period in order to be a success at a certain point? I couldn't I was knocking on doors for the last three years. Hi, I'm Sarisha. This is what I do. This is who I am. But the opportunities were not coming to me at that time. And when I realized why, and that only happened this year, it was because I wasn't ready for it. Because in retrospect, now opportunities are there and all of these doors are open and I'm like, oh my goodness, what do I do with this now? So are you ready for that abundance? And are you ready for the success and the hours and dedication that it takes to be successful? Because it is super lonely. So to answer the question directly, I think it's quite challenging. It really just depends on mindset and, and how you think as a person. You spoke about success and that being subjective. What's your definition of success? Having more free time and peace. And people say that money, you can't buy time with money. But for me, my understanding is I can buy resource that will free up my time to be able to sit on the beach with my dog <laughs> and not have to stress that would be success for me just being able to be at peace um, on a beach and not have to stress now i go to the beach and i'm having to stress about multiple things and different things all the time but if i could just be there and fully be in the moment and present that's success for me because i'm at peace currently i can't say i'm at peace i mean running two startups is not a joke I don't know whose idea that was, <laughs> but um, blessed and grateful. Okay, let's get into those startups. So let's talk about Lloyd Up. Could you walk me through how you started that and currently where you're at? So this started in 2019. I went to World Economic Forum um, in Cape Town and um, I was listening to talks on legal tech and it seemed so far-fetched. I was like, this is never going to happen. Like this doesn't even make sense, you know, how would it also integrate within the African context because we are suffering with way bigger things from a social impact perspective. Legal is not going to be one that's really going to be something that we should be focusing on when there's people that are dying of hunger, right? That was my thinking. And again, I love doing research. I went home and started YouTubing legal tech. What does this mean? Because I come from a legal background. So I studied two degrees in law but I'm not a practicing attorney. I chose to go the entrepreneurship route, then um, actually be, be practicing. And went home and realized that there was so much of a gap in the market, but I still felt like, I'm not too sure if this was the right continent to be starting it in. Africa has abundance of opportunity, but connectivity was an issue. So legal tech, how is tech gonna work if we don't even have Wi-Fi and data? And then the next year, COVID happened, and I'm like, okay, no better time than now, because people could not reach their attorneys, sign documents. Um, there were more startups coming up. There were more entrepreneurs having to make it work by themselves. There was huge retrenchments across the board. So there was no better time than 2020. Retrospect, maybe there was a better time, like now, but that's where the seed was planted. I registered the company and I started building the tech. And uh, three, three years later, there was many ups and downs, losses, a lot of tech opportunities that were lost in the process. It was finding the wrong resource. It was not having enough money. It was bootstrapping. It, it comes with so many different aspects. It's not a small business. It's a startup. And a startup really needs a super strong CTO. So it was difficult. I mean, I went through so many challenges. And to finally see that work is incredible. And what we are basically doing is democratizing access to legal within the African continent, um, utilizing generative AI, natural language processing, and deep learning. So we automate mundane tasks. Um, and by automating these tasks for attorneys, we're able to reduce the costing. And our direct target market is startups and SMEs. And um, we found that there was a gap in the ecosystem. So you go to so many of these events and um, there are no proper support from a legal perspective. You're getting financial literacy, you're getting marketing lit literacy, strategy, but no one is really saying from a legal perspective, are you compliant? Do you have your proper due diligence? And if you're not compliant, no one's gonna fund you. So essentially it does affect the ecosystem drastically 
because corporate governance is important. So that's that's pretty much how how Lloyd up stemmed. Yeah, you basically answered my rest of the questions. So. Oh no, I <laughs> love what I do, so I end up like I love it going into it. I love I'm it. so sorry. But um, maybe let's talk about um, how you actually make money from this. Um, you spoke about what Lloyd up does, and you spoke about who your target market is. So maybe how do you make money, and maybe the future plans of Lloyd up. Um, so right now it's a B two B to C model. And we are integrating into incubators, accelerators, venture capitals, um, and different, I would say, venture builders. So if they house startups and SMEs, and they are dedicating a certain program or cohort to 20 startups, they pay us a monthly subscription to give them a certain amount of hours per startup. Anything aside from that, the startup pays themselves. We've also then created packages, pre-seed, seed, venture capital, and scale, where each of these packages include um, due diligence or corporate governance documents that you might need through your journey. Um, and then it's white labeling the solution for, for law firms as well. Okay. And of course, when you go into different countries, you have different legislation. So how do you combat to that um, hindrance? Um, so in Kenya, for example, we have 400 startups there and we have Kenya attorneys. And then in Nigeria, we started with um, getting the resource first. So we have a thousand attorneys and now in the new year, um, we're looking to get uh, people that utilize the service. And in Botswana, we have 80 startups and we have Botswana attorneys dealing with the Botswana startups. So region specific, jurisdiction specific to the services rendered. And future plans for Lloyd Up? Is it to scale to all African countries? Is it to scale globally? I would say that our market is definitely Africa. Um, there's a huge gap right now. And with the incredible amount of startups that we have and the ecosystem that we're creating in Africa, I do think that having a legal partner or an outsourced legal partner of some sort is highly beneficial for your business from the beginning. So if you can be fully compliant from the beginning, it makes your um, obtaining capital with VCs or angels way earlier because now you have a proper legal data room. So our expansion um, for, the, for at least the next year or two would be solely within the African context and uh, making sure that we are getting those MOUs and partnerships with accelerators that have two to three cohorts uh, per year or incubators uh, per year. Um, from a global perspective, we've registered an LLC, um, which allows us international pipeline of investment. But ideally, my target and where I want to impact is within the African continent. Why? Why? Being a African woman in tech in Africa is something that doesn't happen often. It is a very male-dominated industry. And to be able to come in and inspire other women to go into STEM has been incredible. Um, we need more women in the tech space to enable us to scale and move further. We find that maybe only 2% of um, women in tech or women-founded startups are being funded. But the success in Africa. in Africa. But the success of that is way higher. If you're having a female in your founding team, you find that you, you're able to go way further from a success perspective than if you just have males. So there's, I think, a certain level of, I don't know what to call it. I don't want to call it nurturing, but we come with the sense of we're open to collaborate. And this is the, the issues that we're seeing, whether it be social impact, whether it be tech-driven, we can go into communities and talk. We have that sense of, I want to help and I can help and how can I do it? And me being a woman myself, sitting in these rooms with a lot of, of men has encouraged me to just want to have more females in the room. You know, like, let's do this and then we can do it. And it's been so great to see. Is this, do you think, from, I would say, an IQ versus EQ point of view, that when you have a founding female in your team, you're more likely to succeed? I'm not sure what the stats are, but maybe, what's your opinion on that? 
and why is that? Women never had the opportunities that men have had for a long time. And if we're given the opportunity, we're going to make sure that we see it to the end and do it to the best that we can. So it's almost like we have to bang our hands against our chest to be heard. But when we are heard, we make sure that it's loud and clear and we'll take it to the very end. Whereas men are slightly used to having these opportunities presented to them on a much easier platform um, compared to females. So I think that our drive and determination uh, coupled with that nurturing aspect to it and being able to walk into a room and speak really is a success factor uh, for founding teams right now and, and female founders in specific. And in your opinion, what needs to happen for more female founders to be brought up into the startup ecosystem, into the essentially startup world in Africa? More STEM programs. It really comes down to knowledge and knowing that we are capable and we have the support. Our support is very different to what males need because we're coming with different responsibilities in life. Um, and I'm speaking just generally, this is not personal, I don't have kids and I'm not married, but women have to consider that, right? So men need to consider it too, but the context of it is that the woman is generally, or not generally, but is the carrier. So you having to give birth, you having to nurture this kid, you having to look after your family, still be a boss woman in, in the boardroom, still be um, showing up every day despite challenges that you might face. And it's, it's a lot harder um, to come into a tech space that's male dominated where it wasn't maybe something that was studied at university. So how do you overcome those barriers? really just down to knowledge and the support that you're getting from the different ecosystems uh, within, within the African continent. Yeah, I agree. I think that the support is a big thing, um, especially hearing it from women that have possibly done it and passing that knowledge back onto the younger generation. That is something that I've noticed that there's a gap. Speaking about another gap, your second startup is <laughs> Boardroom. So could you walk us through what boardroom is and um, where did the idea come from and also what stage it's at now okay so boardroom is a dating app for professionals and I think just not being in the dating space for over two and a half years just based on fully focusing on scaling Lloyd up um, it wasn't really something firstly it actually wasn't something I was planning to do um, it always came to me um, so it is a dating app for professionals like myself that doesn't have time. So I have not dated in a long time. Um, I don't go out. I generally just spend time at home with my dog or working. And if you were to think about a lot of the people that we are surrounded by and how hectic this year has been, if you want to grow your business and you've been in business this year, a lot of people have said how difficult it's been. So if you're not going out, you're not dating, you're only sitting at home, what are the chances of finding someone? And I've just turned 30 and it gets lonely. So Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I was um, chatting to a colleague uh, within the tech space as well. And he had made mention to him wanting to work on this dating app. And I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. And he's like, well, look at yourself. Like you have not dated <laughs> in two and a half years. Um, you know, if you were to have a dating app, what would it need to have? And I was like, well, I would not be looking to like l hook up. You know, I, I wouldn't want to go on a platform that's just about hookups. I would really want to be able to find genuine connection. And um, he built this thing and I think it was about a month. We piloted almost just for fun on my story. I piloted that and we now have over 12,000 downloads. Wow. We've been around for three months now and we've been revenue generating from month one. And we had a tweet that went out that was viral of six million. Um, and then we were News 24. What is and the tweet? The, uh, just what boardroom is. Okay. And he tweeted that and I put it on my story. It was all organic. And then it just grew into what it is today. So trying to manage both of those as the CEO um, is really challenging. So uh, a lot of measures that need to be put in place for the new year. Um, Before we talk about responsibilities, yeah. so tell me more about Boardroom. So what's the plan for that? How do you make money out of that, for one? 
and what's the feedback been like from customers? Okay, so you apply to be on the on the platform. It takes about forty eight hours for you to be accepted. Once you're on the platform, um, you have five codes to send out to five of your friends. Um, so it's more about quality than quantity, um, and it is an LSM 7 to 10, that might sound a little bit ugly, but um, we're looking for professional individuals um, because it connects against LinkedIn, there's a certain type of individual that we're trying to get on from the app. So we vet you and there's a criteria and then once you want, you can upgrade to a higher premium. Um, there's two different premiums, there's the executive and the gold, but to get on the app is free. So we're making money on subscription base. Okay, and the feedback? Um, people are loving it. They find that it's more secure in you coming onto this app and you knowing that you're finding professional people. From a secure perspective, we're talking about there's no bots. Some apps are having bots, you know, find themselves on it and, and present, and you don't know who's real and who's not. And one of our main judging criteria is how active are you on LinkedIn? So if we're using LinkedIn as a base point, um, do you post often? Do you engage often? How long have you had LinkedIn? Is your profile photo clear? So that we're making it secure. You can't have glasses on in your profile photo. Okay. We want to see your face. Um, so that's, that's the sort of things. It's, it's also safer. So we've had someone say that they felt safe as well um, through, through the application. From those 12,000, we actually only had 2,000 or 3,000 matches this far. And the pure reason for that is we've declined a lot of people. So even though there were that many downloads, not all of those people were accepted. There's been recurring revenue and it's only been month three. So let's see whether people are still on month three that were the same as month one, because it's also a dating app, right? So. Um, are you looking to have people stay on there for long periods or are you having to, to find people that are new? Mm. So what is your success of that? Because if you're on there for more than like six months or a year, then it's not working for you because then you haven't found love. Because essentially it's to delete eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's been very interesting for me. You know, it wasn't something that I was planning to do this year. So it's been super interesting to just uh, look at the stats uh, from a dating app perspective and how that's a billion dollar industry and you would you wouldn't think so i mean i because i wasn't on dating apps I, I didn't know what the industry was like and when i looked at the stats it was really quite impressive to see how many individuals go online dating um just from way of life and, and like being busy and currently is it just in south africa it is open globally um so it is obscuring our data slightly but we opened it globally just to see what our next market is going to be um, so majority South Africa Joburg Durban Cape Town and our next market is the UK and then the US okay so Q1 UK uh, early Q1 and then Q1 end of Q1 or maybe early Q2 the US what's the process of actually opening up to another market internationally? Um, from a corporate governance perspective, I really think that the main thing is to have your entity registered there, doing research and data collection on whether the product is going to fit and work in those markets. So from some of the individuals that we do have on the platform, it's really just getting their feedback and saying, would it be something that your friends are interested in? Add your friends to it. Tell us what they think of it. Of course, the swiping is not going to be much, but um, it allows us to gauge to see whether it is of interest and potentially introducing new features to attract that specific market. Research is so important. You, you cannot just throw things against the wall and look at what sticks. It's, it's about doing extensive research for your market and understanding your market. And if that comes with maybe a strategic partner, mm. um, finding someone that's based in the UK or a, a specific state in the US, do that. It's so important um, to have a base and to have uh, an expansion partner in the region that you're looking to expand in. So responsibilities. How do you manage responsibilities between your two startups plus consulting for um, the capital, venture capital? Temporary capital. Yeah. It's been tough. I think because it wasn't part of what my plan was for this year. 
I never had a moment to think about it. It was one month, boardroom was not there, and then a month later it was there. And the anticipated growth, I think, also was just quite shocking. I mean, we were not anticipating the feedback that we got. So trying to manage the one business that has now scaled after, or scaling after three years, which is Lloyd Up, and the second that has now been two months old, is really challenging for me. I've got to look at lowest hanging fruit right now. How can I make sure that I'm ending this year off strong for both of them, and then utilizing December to map out additional resource that I'm going to need? While understanding and considering that resource comes at a cost. So how much can Lloyd Up afford from a resource perspective? And the same for boardroom. And having to wear that CEO cap as well as a investor cap on some days, or startup CEO cap and investor cap on some days, um, has really helped me to understand what startups need. So taking on this opportunity at Timboti, which has been incredible, also allows me to understand the gaps within the startup space. Because I would hope to have a successful exit one day and invest back into the ecosystem. Um, mainly social impact, potentially women-led. I mean, that's definitely something that I'm very passionate about. Social justice. And it's been hard for me to think about all of these things. So it's having to really just sit for a week or two and just be silent and say, okay, what, what am I feeling? And how does that look like for the new year? And what do I see for the new year? What keeps you going on a daily basis keeps you persevering, having that grit to keep going? I failed so many times that I just kept pushing it in and I didn't want to give up. And the moment when I realized that I determine when I fail and not anyone else is when I decided to, I'm never going to give up until there's nothing left in me. And that would probably be the moment where I'm no longer on this planet because I feel like there's so many opportunities and things to fix that I want to be a part of that growth. Africa Arena. How valuable have they been along your journey? And um, if you could provide some feedback for other entrepreneurs. This is my favorite tech festival, um, tech conference. My first ever pitch was Africa Arena three years ago, and it was terrible. <laughs> I learned so much uh, from, from that. And it's brought me to where I am today. And I say that because the support that they've given me along this three years of being part of the ecosystem has been incredible. And not only have I been supported, but now I am in turn supporting the startup boot camps and the different startups within the ecosystem and giving back, um, whether it be in hours, whether that be in legal services, whether that be however I can, you know. So the first year with Africa Arena, I came in as a pitching. And the second year I came in as a speaker and this is my third year and now I'm very much part of the ecosystem and they are using me for legal services themselves, um, expansion partners, um, just fully within the ecosystem and it's just been incredible to have them in my corner. Amazing. Cool. Sirisha, thank you. Thank you for your time. This is valuable. And um, thank you also for the impact that you're making, not only in South Africa, but in Africa. And um, I wish you all the best in your um, endeavors in the future. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank cool. you for having me.